Every semester in my communication courses, I ask students to set goals and I'll say, what do you want to do or how do you want to be better? 99.9% .9 of them say, I want to be a better communicator or a better talker or articulate my thoughts. Rarely do I have a student that says, I would like to be a better listener. And yet of all the communication skills that you can learn, this is the one that I hope you'll really dive into, take to heart, apply what you learned. You're gonna see research and some assessments, and I hope that you will value listening and understand it at a whole new level after this chapter. You're gonna see this great video in this module where the speaker quotes a famous man who said, no one ever listened his way out of a job. Listening is powerful. So let's look at why it's important and how it can help us. So the importance of listening well, research says you are more likely to be hired and promoted if you're a great listener. Listeners are often equated with leaders. When we look at what does a leader do well, we always come back to they listen. Stephen Covey's fifth habit of highly effective people said really good listeners will seek to understand and not to be understood. And that comes with listening. They are not easily fooled. They are not talked into things. They are not convinced. They tend to be critical thinkers. They are often more receptive to advice. Listeners are oft, often receivers. And in communication, we look specifically at trust. We want people who can receive advice. And finally, they are more appealing to a friend or romantic partner. So maybe you find yourself a little bit lonely. One of the skills that will help you make friends or maybe even get a date is learning to listen. Now, Let's look at what listening isn't. From the get-go, I want you to hear this and you'll, you'll hear it repeated. Hearing is not the same as listening. I'm gonna guess that at some point in your life, you heard someone, but you actually weren't listening to them. So, write this down if you're taking notes, but hearing and listening um, are the same thing. That is not true. Hearing and listening are two different things. One is physiological, and the other involves our thought processes, our brain. So when you hear that statement, if you're looking at a quiz that true or false, hearing and listening are the same thing, it's false. They're different things. Okay, listening is a natural process. It's something maybe you were born doing. That's not true either. It is actually a really difficult skill. Therapists get paid well to listen to other people. It's a muscle that they've learned to exercise, a skill that they've actually developed. Everyone receives the same message. Now, you have heard this earlier in the semester, but when we talk about communication, we'll say things like meanings are not in words, they're in people. So when two people hear the same words, they may interpret them to have different meanings. So just because something was said in a room doesn't mean everybody listened the same way or interpreted that message the same. We'll learn about the process in a minute, but I, I want you to know that if you studied three generations, so maybe a young adult and a parent and a grandparent walk into a doctor's office and the doctor gives um, the grandparent a diagnosis, those three people are gonna hang on to different parts that maybe they'll live, maybe they don't have a lot of time to live, um, maybe they just need this extra medicine, but. I would encourage you, ask someone who sat in the same space and maybe heard the same message. Ask them what they took away from that. Okay, so let's look at it. It is a process. It doesn't happen and there are things that we need to understand that are involved. Um, we're gonna look at what we call the Hurrier model and that is an acronym, so I hope, and also a mnemonic. I hope you'll remember Hurrier. Um, and so let's start with the H part. You probably guessed it, it's hearing. Your eardrums have to activate. There's a part of your body physiologically that has to hear. I love watching videos of people who hear someone's voice for the first time. It's really special, um, but there's so much more involved. The U is for understanding. You have to, to say, do I know what those words mean? Oftentimes there's a tone involved that helps with this process. If English isn't your first language and you're listening to someone speak in English, this step could take a little bit because you're actually just trying to understand the words. Then you have 
uh, what we call the remembering phase. We're trying to hold on to what was just said so that you can um, begin to make sense of it. And that's what we call the interpreting phase. You're sort of decoding the meaning, coming back to the communication model, you're interpreting the message that was sent, then you're evaluating. Is it true? Is it right? Is it wrong? This is where sometimes it's the evaluating phase that in communication, when we're really listening, we can tend to get defensive um, and say, I don't agree with what you just said. Finally, we have the responding phase. Sometimes we think this happens verbally, but the truth is it happens non-verbally all the time. If you're on social media and you're listening to a message, you might hit like or subscribe, and that's your response to the communicator, the sender. But in a classroom, I might have students whose faces look confused and they're responding to the message, or they look, um, they might laugh like they understood it. It's no secret, we live in a complex world. If if I was teaching this course 75 years ago, it would be so much easier because there were so fewer messages being sent. But we're having to listen in a world that is not just complex, it's actually very noisy. Your, your textbook talks about message overload. You are inundated with messages and it is almost impossible for you to process and go through that Hurrier model for every single one. You're experiencing something we call rapid thought, where it's almost like a ping pong ball going back and forth inside your brain. And then you experience this thing called psychological noise, where as you're trying to receive all of these messages, whether you want to or not, you have worry and fear and these layers of, what if I don't respond? What if I do? Is this okay? Um, this creates noise in our head that prohibits us from communicating effectively and ultimately prohibits us from connecting. So let's talk a little bit about listening experiences. Um, how do we categorize those? Obviously, on the aggregate, we've talked about this before, statistically. Now, there are always statistical outliers, but what we call in the aggregate or the majority, listening can be organized by gender. It looks different. So let's look at some of the findings from um, our evidence-based research. Okay, women tend to match experiences when they listen. So if someone's sharing a rough day at work, women want to naturally respond and say, ah, oh, me too. It wasn't men that came up with the hashtag me too movement, it was women. They feel more connected when they can relate to experiences. When men are listening, they tend to go into what we call fix it mode. They wanna solve the problem. So to listen just to feel it may feel awkward or they distract often with humor um, or something that feels a little more natural to them. I'm gonna use a phrase that if you have trouble maybe connecting with the opposite gender um, or maybe you're a male who says, I don't think I'm a great listener. I'm gonna give you a phrase that someone gave me a long time ago that was really powerful. When you are listening to someone you genuinely care about, please don't fix it before you feel it. Don't fix it before you feel it. Research says it's natural for you to want to solve or want to fix, but the other person might just want you to listen. Okay, for a man, empathy, or if I say, gosh, I get that, or man, that's hard, they can feel like it's a put down, like the other person's being condescending. It can make them feel vulnerable and weak and can actually um, be very difficult. So they will pivot and say, it is what it is. It's really not that hard, right? That's my best impression of a male. But be very sensitive to that. So we want to find connection and we wanna make sure that it doesn't feel disrespectful in any way. Okay, um, when you jump into problem solving mode, it can feel disinteresting or like you're disinterested to a woman. So this is so fascinating to me, but it comes back to the don't fix it before you feel it. So if you're communicating um, with a woman and you jump into problem solving mode, it can feel like you need to be a superhero or you're going to fix it, but you don't really care about the other person um, or the process that they're going through. Okay, what are we doing wrong when it comes to listening? Well, I'm gonna tell you a lot. We're doing a lot wrong, but let's look at some specific habits that research says a lot of us are doing pretty regularly. We pseudo listen. There is a term called fubbing. 
and I know that seems weird, but it's snubbing people with your phone. You look at it while they're talking. You should know that when you look at your phone in the middle of a conversation, it always sends a message, whether intentional or not, that you don't actually care about the person in front of you or what they're saying. Pseudo listening is pretending to listen. We also have selective listening, super dangerous. And selective listening isn't just, I'm sitting at a lunch table and I overhear someone talking about my favorite sports team, so I wanna engage in that conversation. Selective listening happens on social media and it happens in our streaming choices. We only listen to messages that we already agree with or things we already believe in. And this can be dangerous because when we don't listen to anyone we disagree with, rarely do we learn um, or grow. Defensive listening happens when we feel like we're threatened. Someone says something that maybe threatens our identity or makes us look bad. And so we do something that social scientists call armoring up. It's hard to connect with someone who's wearing armor. So when we want to be a good listener, especially when we're dealing with something that could be interpreted as conflict, we have to tell ourselves, don't get defensive, don't get defensive. This is something that I have learned, not just in my communication research, but also in therapy. We have insulated listening, or we, have a, uh, we live kind of in a bubble. And again, this could be on an, in a very extreme case, like a cult. Right? I've become very insular and I don't listen to any outside voices about anything. And that can, again, be a dangerous place because it's hard to connect with other people. It's actually just hard to grow. Insensitive listening. And this is where we send messages like, it is what it is, or it sucks to be you, or don't you know it's supposed to be hard, right? When we don't express empathy or use with our words that that person is valuable and their emotions are valuable and their problems are valuable, it could come across insensitive and obviously lead to disconnection. All right, just a couple more, narcissistic. If you don't know, there's a small portion of the population that are diagnosed actually as narcissists and that simply means you're unbelievably selfish and you have no thought for other people. So when you listen, because you're waiting to reply, or because you want to be heard, or you're using it to manipulate the other person. That's a narcissistic listener. Stephen Covey says, we should always seek to understand, not to be understood. It should be about the other person. It is not for a narcissist. All right. Overly talkative. This is the last bad listening habit, and I, ironically, it's probably the one I struggle with the most. We can tend to just hear a little bit of what someone says, and then unleash all of our thoughts and opinions onto them. And we want to be careful um, not to do that. Okay, there are different types of listening. And so what I want you to think about is how there are different gears that you might drive in um, for different terrains or for different areas. So you need to find a new gear. You don't have to use this, this really intense um, listening technique everywhere you go, you would be physically and emotionally exhausted. So there are different types of listening and the best communicators, the competent communicators, know which one to use in which context. So let's look at a couple different kinds. You're gonna dive in and, and expand on these more in the text, but I want you to see this. Relational listening is just, just how it sounds. I'm developing a relationship. So I'm listening as I build our friendship. I'm not trying to solve anything. I don't have to figure out what the important thing is. You're not asking me to think through and share my opinion. You're just asking me as a friend to listen. A supportive listener is usually when someone needs someone to listen because they're going through something really hard. Now, some of this may overlap with relational listening, but supportive listening is where someone's in a spot and they say, I just need you to listen. Maybe they've lost someone. Maybe they lost a job or a spouse. Maybe they had a relationship just ended and they said, I don't need anything from you. I just need you to listen. Task-oriented listening is oftentimes when we're in situations where we need to listen so that we can go, hey, after listening to you talk, here's what needs to get done. So if you're in a meeting, um, maybe you're in a task-oriented situation and you're listening for your boss 
to they're talking and you're going, I need to listen because I need to hear what needs to be done. You should enter a task-oriented listening gear at the end of a class because that's what's going, what you're going to need to hear to do next. Maybe you're at home and you're like my family where we group up and say, all right, here's what has to get done today. Here are the chores. And I need my kids to listen um, with their task-oriented gear in mind. Analytical listening can happen oftentimes in jobs or maybe you have a situation where you're listening to a doctor or you're listening to maybe a mechanic and you're trying to make sense and understand what is happening. And so your brain goes into um, a little bit of an analytical listening mode where you're trying to understand. A little bit different than that, this is our last one, and that's critical mode where you're listening for inconsistencies or you're listening to say, hey, I don't know that this is the best course of action or the best decision. When people come to me and ask me to help coach them with speeches, I'm listening critically, trying to find errors, find inconsistencies. So oftentimes, um, my husband, an engineer, is also listening critically to say, here's what we're missing here. So you have to find uh, an intellectual gear to listen that way. You're not just saying, man, I'm sorry, or, oh, that's hard. You're like, no, 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 join me. I need help. Listen to me and then help me understand what's missing here. All right. In this world, as we get ready to wrap this up, in this world of craziness, I want you to think about this idea of pseudo listening. And I want you to think about it, not from the listening perspective, but from the sender perspective. You're going to take a minute and really think through in your journaling time, when is the time I didn't feel heard? And what did that feel like? Take that perspective taking. I hope that it will help you not become a pseudo listener to those around you. It's really easy to do. But when we listen, we connect with other people. And I want to end again with Dr. Turkle's words that are so powerful, right? That we're in a world where everyone's sending messages. No one is listening. We don't want to live alone together. And it starts with us becoming better listeners. I hope you enjoyed this chapter, but most of all, I hope you'll take this information. You'll connect it to your life. And then it will lead you to connect to the people that you care about and that matter most.